Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. I recently posted a video about the things that I like about living in Haiti. And I thought it would be great to also talk about the many challenges that I face living here and some of the things that I don't like. So one of the challenges that I face living here in Haiti is that we have limited access to basic necessities. Electricity is provided by the government. They are the sole provider. So we get electricity through Ide Ash and it is very inconsistent. I can't even say it's based on the city you're in or the town you're in because you could be in a city and your neighborhood gets electricity maybe every four days and then the neighborhood right next to yours might get electricity every day. It really depends on what grid you're in. For me, it doesn't matter where I live, how consistent the electricity is, how inconsistent it is, we are always going to have our own electric system. So we have solar panels and inverter, batteries. It's great when you have Ideash to charge your batteries. So if Ideash comes once a day for a few hours, and that's great because it can charge up your batteries. But if we don't have Ideash, then we just make sure that we have enough solar panels or a generator to charge our batteries. Another basic necessity that we've had limited access to is gas. So I'm sure you have seen the news and you've heard all about it, but we've been dealing with gas shortages here since September, 2019. When I think about some of the situations, I am just like, like, oh my gosh, I'm happy we at least have gone past that. Like there have been gas shortages, but it's not as bad as it was in 2020 and 2021. Oh my goodness. Whew. That was some really hard times. That was some really hard times. And we would be fighting for gas, like waiting in line for four or five hours for gas, just sitting in our car waiting for gas. And then you get to the front and they're like, that's it, all done. They close it up right in front of you, like just close everything up, we're done, no more gas. Or people will start fighting and we'll have to leave because there were gas stations that caught on fire. I remember one time in Okap, this was before I moved to this area, there was a gas tank that like flipped over and people were stealing gas from it, like gas was leaking out and people were like filling up buckets of gas because gas was so rare, it became like this hot commodity or something. And people were doing things that they probably usually wouldn't do. You know, obviously gas is highly flammable, so it's not something that you would really mess with. You already know what happened next. The gas tank exploded with people right there trying to get gas. So just horrific. The gas shortage has increased the price of public transportation, especially when we are currently in a gas shortage. So just expect the price to be two, three, four, five times the price it would be. Also businesses can't function properly because they need gas for their generators like hotels. They have their AC on for limited hours of the day. So they might have it on only at night. So businesses have definitely had to make changes because of the gas shortage. Another basic necessity that we have limited access to is healthcare. You might have better luck with, you know, private clinics and hospitals, but public hospitals, uh, it's definitely hard to be seen. It's definitely not a guarantee. You might go there and not find a doctor. You might go there and their generator doesn't have any gas, so they cannot operate on you. And then private hospitals, it depends on the hospital. For me, I try not to think about it too much. There are certain things that you can just get on your own, like electricity, water, and all of that. But then there are certain things like healthcare that's just like, I don't, I don't know. The next challenging thing to deal with is how expensive it is here. I never imagined that Haiti would be this expensive. Even though I visited Haiti very frequently before moving here, there were a lot of things that I did not know because I was visiting, I was not living here. So when you are living here, you're finding an apartment, you're going to grocery stores, you're buying things for your house, and you're just doing certain things because you're living in the country. That's when you truly see how expensive it is. When you are just here on vacation, you're just here for you know two weeks, or you're here for the summer, because I used to spend the whole summer in Haiti and I used to come during the other breaks. I'll be here in spring break, I'll be in winter break. There was just certain things I didn't find out until I moved here. There was never a time when I was visiting that I was touring apartments and all of that. So when it was time for me to look for an apartment and I'm on the different websites, cause at that time I lived in the West apartment. And if you live in the port au -Prince area, there are so many different real estate agents or real estate companies that have websites and you can go online and you can see the properties and all the pictures and they have the prices there as well. So when I started going through these different websites, I was like, wait a minute, 
What are these American prices? What are these, you know, back when I lived in Maryland prices? I'm like, why does it seem like I'm renting an apartment in Maryland or something? Cause I lived in Maryland. So I'm just going based on the prices that I used to see in Maryland. I'm like, why do they look the same? What's going on here? Why is it so expensive? I was truly in shock. I was truly in shock. And I spoke to a lot of realtors and they explained that after the earthquake, there were a lot of foreigners here, a lot of organizations here, and there was also limited homes. A lot of homes were destroyed, so there weren't a lot of options as well. So they could definitely take advantage of that. And the prices were very high during that time. And they basically never came back down. I heard that from quite a few real estate agents and I believe that's what happened. I could imagine that. I feel like prices here aren't regulated people can just pick and choose what they want to do it's not just about housing but also like at the grocery store like all the stores everything that's imported as well and obviously okay it's imported so it's going to be more expensive than what they bought it for but sometimes it is just like four times the price or it's just very just just very very high but there's obviously a portion of the population that can afford all these things and so that's why they are at the prices that they are another challenge is that it's pretty difficult to settle in so getting any type of registration documents ids just anything that you might need to function is pretty difficult especially if you have to do it in any government office there are usually these people that are right outside the government offices people call them rakite but they are there to kind of get you in, get what you need quick. Like they're standing there like, oh, what do you need? What do you need? Um, okay, I'll get it for you, I'll get it for you. And basically you have to pay them like a fee and they'll do everything for you. And that's because it's so unorganized, it lacks structure. You need a simple document. You could spend days trying to get it, months trying to get it, years trying to get it. Y'all, I did not get my ID card until last year. Until last year. I tried to get it as soon as I moved. I went to the picture, did everything. Okay, I'm getting my ID, had all the documents that were necessary. Okay, cool. I went to go get that ID and they were like, oh, can't find it. Don't see it. I went several times, I went for months. Then I ended up leaving Puerto Prince and I moved to La Cibonit. I started working in La Cibonit and I would come back like on Friday and try to make it to Puerto Prince before they closed. And I would go to their office and I'm like, I'm here to get my ID. They're like, nope, not there. Then at a certain point, I just gave up. I gave up on it. I was like, I'm not doing it, whatever, forget it. Then when we moved to Ocap, we went to Plaisance and got it done there. It was quick and easy. I think I got it in like a month and a half or so, but I finally have my national ID card. It's also a voter's card so I can vote with it. And if you are born in Haiti, you can get any ID here, any ID. Even though you can get any ID here, it might be hard for you to actually get it, but you should definitely have at least one Haitian ID. And because I already had a Haitian ID, that's why I wasn't too pressed about the national ID card. I was like, uh, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. I still don't have a Haitian driver's license. I tried to get it in Porto Plants, but I remember the area that I would have to go to to get it had some like insecurity issues and Sammy didn't want us to go to that area. Like there was just always something happening where I just never went to get my Haitian driver's license. I used my Maryland one and since I already had one Haitian ID I'm like okay I'm able to use that ID to do all the things that I need to do like open a bank account if you are born here but you became a citizen of another country you can still renew your passport once you are born here you are born here you're Haitian you're Haitian you can pretty much do everything in this country with a few exceptions but if you are Haitian but you weren't born here there are certain things that you're not going to be able to get because you need your birth certificate that's the starting point for all these documents, all these IDs, whatever. But at least you can get your driver's license. I'm pretty sure anyone can get a driver's license. So that is a valid Haitian ID. So you can use that for different things that you need to do in the country. Besides getting an ID, there were a lot of things that were difficult for me to do. Like when I was registering my car, it was easy for me to get my car out of customs. That was so easy, quick and smooth. I shipped my car to Go Naive. Didn't know anybody who worked in customs, just went in there very quick and easy gave me a very good price as soon as i told the director i moved here from the u.s he was like you did what excuse me huh <laughs> tell me more what yeah he was really cool and yeah that was very quick and easy but registering my car 
was really hard because at that time, Boave City was on strike and I had to get insurance before I could get my license plates. And it was just very hard for me to move around because I had to keep getting this authorization from the police. But the place that I had to go to to get the authorization was in an area that I did not feel comfortable going to all the time. And they would give you the authorization for like three days. So I was driving around without license plates and the police kept pulling me over. Automatically, you're gonna get pulled over if you don't have license plates. They're gonna pull you over. And when I say pull you over, I mean, they're gonna stop you at a checkpoint. So in Haiti, you'll see checkpoints all the time. Like as you're driving, you'll see police standing in the middle of the road. As soon as they saw me and I did not have plates, they were like, pull over to the side. Pull over to the side, ma'am. <laughs> but they could not give me a ticket because I had a Maryland driver's license. So they couldn't take my license. So basically when you get a ticket here, they take your license and you have to go and pay for whatever they tell you to pay for. And then that's when you can get your license back. And so they could not take my license. So they didn't really do anything. So I was able to get away with it until Oave City opened back up, which was probably like three weeks later, I was able to go to Oave City and get my car registered, but it was very hard. It was very hard. That first time, oh my gosh, I have never seen a run around like this. It was like, go here, go there, go here, then go to pay over there, then you come back, go outside and uh, make a copy. There was already somebody there making copies, y'all. They said, I'm gonna take advantage of this. I already know these people need to make a copy of whatever they give them, so I'm gonna set up shop right here and make my money. So we had to go right outside the gate, make a copy, then come back, go to this place. Like, it was a lot. I got my car registered at the OAV City in Taba. And so that was the situation there. But there was just no clear instructions that said, okay, you need to go here and then here, then here, A, B, C, D. Like there was no clear instructions. That's one of the things that makes it hard getting settled in here because you can't just Google the process. You can't just say, okay, let me just hop on the internet and see, you know, what is the process like? And even if you can, like even if there's a website that has the process, when you actually go and do the thing, it's like something else. They're like, uh, yeah, that's outdated. You need to do this instead. You need to do this. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> the next challenge I would say is the biggest challenge I face living here. And that is dealing with a corrupt government. Oh my gosh. You would not imagine the things we go through because of corruption. It's just really hard to live somewhere with such high levels of corruption because you are reminded of it every single day and it makes your life harder. I already mentioned how there's limited access to basic necessities. And of course, that is a result of a corrupt government. When you are dealing with such high levels of corruption and a dissatisfied population, you are going to deal with political instability. There are going to be short and long periods of protests. Your daily activities are going to be disrupted. Okay, expect for you to plan an event and boom, have to cancel. Of course, there are times where everything is pretty chill. No one's really doing anything. No one's really saying anything. That might go on for a year or even over a year. And then something kind of sparks it and you see months of protests and months of people fighting for something. Whether they are fighting against corruption, inequality, limited access to basic needs or basic human rights or whatever it is, there are going to be periods where people are coming together for a cause and that is going to impact your day-to-day -day activities. Over the past three years or so, there has been a rise in insecurity. For sure, the West Department has been hit pretty hard. There are parts of Latibonit that also experience this gang activity and it is a result of corruption. Now the world knows what we in Haiti have always known. There have been many political leaders who have been sanctioned for financing gangs. You can find all of this online. The sanctions are public. You'll see their names and you'll see their titles. There are both past and present political leaders on that long list. And of course, the list doesn't just have political leaders on it. There are also some very wealthy people in the private sector on that list. A lot of the people that I know or that I've seen online that have moved to Haiti, they usually move from the U.S. So I've seen a lot of those people move back to the U.S. after all of this has started. Some people even move back way before all of this started because there are a lot of challenges leaving here. And if you're one of the people who are thinking about moving back or you're planning on moving back, like you've already made arrangements to move back, don't even waste your time trying to explain to 
people, why you're moving, what you're doing. They're not going to understand. And that's also fine. You know, because some people will message me. They're like, man, everybody is discouraging me from moving and all that. And it's just like, you know, everybody got to do what works for them. Like if this is something that you want to do and you know is right for you, then there's no need to go and try to convince everybody. You know, you don't have to convince everybody and you might move and it doesn't work out. You might say, hey, there are way more things that I don't like versus what I actually like. So I'm leaving, I'm out, it's not for me. But there's definitely a community of people who have moved here, who are planning to move here. I get so many messages from people, so many questions, emails, DMs on Instagram, and I give a lot of advice to people about moving here. And this is why I have the Moving to Haiti 101 series. I put all of the videos related to moving to Haiti in one playlist, it's called Moving to Haiti 101. If you wanna see some of the other videos in the playlist, then just go to the playlist tab and you'll see all of my playlists in the same place and just click on the one that says Moving to Haiti 101 and then you know you can watch some of the other videos i'm definitely going to post more as i get more questions and more topics so as i see people are asking the same questions i'm like okay if people are interested in that let me do a video about it to answer some of these questions so that i don't have to keep you know responding to people individually i can just refer them to the video a lot of people have asked me about doing a video about finding an apartment in old cop and the reason why i haven't done it yet is because it is so hard to find an apartment here or find a house here and i don't know if i could really be helpful i don't know what i could tell you that would actually help you get a house but for now leave some other questions down below or some other video topics down below and be sure to check out the Moving to Haiti playlist for more videos related to moving to Haiti. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye.